Hello again, STAT students. In our last video, we learned how to do a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Today, we're going to do a chi-squared test for independence, which means that we're going to see if two um, categorical or qualitative variables are independent of each other. It's in a later lesson, I'll show you how that's actually like comparing multiple proportions together. So, and we've previously learned that um, to how to do a one sample a Z test for proportions, a two sample Z test for proportions, and then we have the, for multiple proportions, we'll do a, a chi-squared test for independence. So, uh, let me share my screen with you and we'll get started. So for a test for independence, we need to write the, um, learn how to write the hypotheses. As we learned in the goodness of fit test, we don't use equations anymore, we use a sentence. Uh, we're going to do the same thing here in the test for independence. We're also going to learn how to calculate expected values. In the goodness of fit test, we just multiplied our um, number of observed values by the percentages in the given distribution. It's going to be a little bit different today. And then we're going to learn how to calculate degrees of freedom. And that'll be a little bit different to, from the goodness of fit test as well. <clears throat> so let's say that we uh, want to know if there is a relationship between getting passing grades, which is a C or better in this example, and how many um, hours a week you put into extracurricular activities. Now, obviously, these are um, categorical or qualitative variables. So are these. And I want to know if there's a relationship. I'm not saying there's a cause and effect. I'm not defining what the relationship is. Um, if there is one, we'll have to figure out where that relationship is later, <clears throat> do some follow-up analysis. But I just want to know if there's a relationship. So there are two ways I could write the null. One is that, one is that this variable and this variable are independent, or there's no relationship between this variable and this variable. So in the goodness of fit test, the hypothesis was always, always, always the same. Um, the given distribution is correct. That's our null. In this case, it's the formats the same, which is either the column variables and the row variables, and you state what those are, are independent, or another way of saying that is there's no relationship between the column variables and the row variables. And of course, again, it's important to state what those variables are. <coughs> so here's the format for the hypotheses. And you just fill in what the row and column variables are. Now, on page 538 of our current textbook, <coughs> we have some requirements here, some conditions. Um, it says the observed frequencies must be obtained using a random sample. It doesn't say simple random sample. It just says random. The expected frequencies must be greater than or equal to 5. If they are not, you don't have a big enough sample. So um, when you learn how to get the expected frequencies, you'll see why that's the case. But <clears throat> as it stands right now, if your expected frequencies are less than or equal to five, um, you can't do it. There is a condition, we'll get to that condition later. It's one of those rules of thumb that allow us to Break the, break the rules, break the conditions, and still get 
a good result. But for right now, our thinking is going to be all of our expected values have to be at least five. Our degrees of freedom, um, we have row, col row variables and column variables in this case. That's why we set it up in a table known as a contingency table. And the degrees of freedom is the number of rows of data you have minus one times the number of columns of data you have minus one. And our test statistic chi-squared is still going to be the sum of O minus E quantity squared divided by E. That's just our formula for calculating the chi-squared statistic and each of its components. <laughs> so I'm going to um, explain what you're seeing here. You'll be able to stop the video and copy down anything you'd like. All right. <clears throat> These numbers in the um, upper left that I've put in green here, hopefully you can see the difference between the colors. These ones in the upper left-hand part of each cell are my observed counts. So I went out and gathered um, some data. I gathered 119 pieces of data. And I've had 11 students who had C's or better who had under two hours of extracurricular activities a week. I had 68 students with C's or better who had between two and 12 hours of extracurriculars a week. And I had three students who had C's or better um, have more than 12 hours of extracurricular, et cetera. So you can see that when I add across, I got 82 C's or better. And with these um, top left or green numbers, when I added across, I had 37, totaled 119 students. Same here, when I added down, the numbers still add up to 119. So where did these red numbers, these lower right numbers, these expected counts come from? Well, I'm going to show you. Um, well, I'm really not sure if I wanna put that in this video, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So the expected counts are the row total times the column total divided by the total total. Now, what I'm stressing over is am I gonna show you why that works? So this 13.8 came from the row total, 82, times the column total, 20, divided by the total total, 119. And I got 13.8. Now you say, how could you have 13.8? It's um, since these are numbers, it's okay to take them to the tenths place. Um, it'll make our chi square statistic more accurate. So um, for this number, 62.7, I got that by going row total times column total divided by total total. Now you'll notice here that number is less than five. And we learned in our conditions that that's not okay. Here is a rule of thumb. If no more than one out of five, first off, all of them gotta be greater than one. All of your expected values have to be greater than one. And our conditions are they all have to be greater than five, but the test will still work if they're all greater than one and no more than one out of five is less than five. Well, one out of five would be 20%. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six um, data cells, and one out of six is less than five. Well, one out of six is only 16 and two thirds percent. That's less than 20, that's less than one out of five. So the fact that it's greater than one and no more than one out of five is less than five, I can still do the um, chi-squared test for independence. So again, we got each of those expected counts 
by doing the row total times the column total divided by the total total. <clears throat> and why does that work? Without going into it um, in detail, I'll just say that if the variables are independent, if there is no relationship between those variables, then you'll notice that you're getting percentages here. The row total divided by the total total will give you a percentage times a column total. If they're independent, if there's no relationship, um, this formula will work. <laughs> so what fraction of my students had a C or better? And we're just going to do it. What fraction of my students had a C or better? Let's go back to my data. The fraction of those students that had a C or better is 82 out of 119. Now, how many students had less than two hours of uh, extracurricular activities a week? 20. So all things being equal, how many of these 20 would you expect to have a C or better? Well, you would expect 82 out of 119, whatever that is, times 20. So it's this divided by this times this, or this times this divided by this. So again, if you've written that down, if you've copied that chart down, now take a look at these questions. What fraction of those 119 had a C or better? This fraction. 20 of them had um, fewer than two uh, hours of extracurricular activities a week. So all things being equal, we would expect this fraction of those 20, which would be 82 119 times 20, which is row total times column total divided by total total. That is where the 13.8 came from right here. And now that you can see that's going to work, you can apply the row total times column total divided by total total formula to get these other values. <laughs> and again, as I stated uh, previously, it's okay to do the chi-squared test for independence if no more than one out of five cells in your contingency table is less than five. And that's for the expected values. Of course, they all have to be greater than one. So this is just one of those rules of thumb that allows us to cheat the formal uh, conditions and still get a good, um, good result. <laughs> So how do we calculate the chi-square statistic? Well, if you do it the way your book does it and you do it the way Sal Khan does it, if you watch Khan Academy, I don't like it. It's not very clear. So what we need to do is we need to come up with a chi-square component for each of these six cells in our contingency table. And the formula is O minus E quantity squared divided by E. So 11 minus 13.8 quantity squared divided by 13.8. And I need to do 68 minus 62.7 quantity squared over 62.7, but I don't just want to write it out in a long row. I want my chi-squared components to be in the same format as my data. So I have two rows, three columns, so I want my chi-square components to be written in two rows and three columns. So I write them like this. <clears throat> and the reason we want that is if it turns out that this is statistically significant, if we're in the rejection region, if we reject our null hypothesis and conclude our high alternate is true, if there is a relationship, I want to see where that relationship is. And where it's going to be is it's going to be in the biggest numbers down here in our components. Well, how do I know where those biggest numbers are in our data? 
Well, if it turns out to be this one and this one, if it's significant, um, I want to be able to find these uh, in my data set. So let's just go through the process. Here's O minus E quantity squared divided by E for my top left data point. Then I got my two rows, I'm sorry, my two rows, my three columns. So for each of those six cells of data, I calculate my chi-square component. Here they are again, still in two rows, three uh, columns. My chi-square component or my chi-square statistic with um, two degrees of freedom actually, because it's three minus one, which is two, times two minus one, which is one. So with two degrees of freedom, my chi-squared statistic is 6.926. Get my picture out of the way there. So here are our degrees of freedom, two degrees of freedom. If you go to your chi-squared table, which in the current book we're using is on page A19, you go to two degrees of freedom, at the 5% level, your critical value, your chi-squared critical, is 5.991. So our rejection region is anything to the right of 5.991. Our chi-squared statistic was 6.9, which is to the right. So we will reject the null hypothesis. So what are we saying? Our null hypothesis is that um, that those two variables, the grades and the time spent um, in extracurricular activities, are not independent, that there is a relationship. So where is that relationship? So this is why I go back here. Now we're going to do our follow-up analysis. We're done with that hypothesis test. We've concluded there is a relationship. If I want to find where that relationship is, I do some follow-up analysis, and I notice the largest components of chi-squared are here and here, bottom right and bottom left. So I come back here, <clears throat> and I would say, well, I expected two and a half here, and I got five. So I got more Ds and Fs than I expected with um, lots of extracurricular activities. And I got um, more Ds and Fs than I expected here at less than two hours. So it turns out that that's where I would do some follow-up analysis. I also got a lot fewer. You'll note, you might recall that the next highest number was here, top right. I got fewer passing grades than I expected if you had a lot of extracurricular hours. So those are some things that would tell us where we would do follow-up analysis. But right now, with uh, the chi-squared test for independence, all we can say is that um, extracurricular hours and grades, whether they're passing or not, they're related. They're not independent. So that is how we do a chi-squared test for independence. Remember that, that um, to get your expected counts for each of your cells in your contingency table, you do row total times column total divided by total total. And then to get your chi-squared statistic you, component for each cell, it's O minus E quantity squared divided by E. And then you add all those components up to get your chi-squared statistic. If, as in the example I gave you, your chi-squared statistic turns out to be um, statistically significant, if it causes you to reject the null, then we start looking for which cells had the largest component of the chi-squared statistic. That's where we're going to look for um, where the relationship between grades and or between our row variable and our column variable 
in this case where for grades and extracurricular, that's where we're gonna look for a discrepancy. So um, hope that makes sense to you. Have a great day.